Hey, good morning. Welcome to our second to last GameCon pre-conference micro session. So I'm saving the best for last. And Nadia is one of those uh, individuals that actually I met you because of our GameCon throwdown. Lead, uh, the lead judge, Jean Maripodi, mm -hmm. we were sitting at a session together, uh, learning solutions or something. And she said, mm -hmm. have you ever heard of Hadia and her, and she's writing a book. And I'm like, no, I do not know this woman. Who is she? And she said, you've got to get her. So that mm -hmm. was how I uh, reached out to uh, connect with you and yeah. see about getting you to come to our very first game of con that we had mm -hmm. in Chicago. Fortunately, yeah. we were in your hometown, so that yeah, exactly. Well. So welcome, 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 and I want to hear all about what you've been working on. And um, I know pandemic has changed a lot, but let's start with uh, when Jean made that introduction to me. She was talking about the brilliance and creativity that you bring to narrative and creation of characters and storytelling. So mm -hmm. you published a book. What what is the name of the book? It's called Story Training. Yeah. Uh, selecting and Shaping Stories That Connect. Yeah. And um, actually in March is going to be its fifth year anniversary. I can't believe it was that long ago. And I have some little things planned around that to celebrate that. Um, but yeah, it just, it seems unbelievable. I always say that the one true thing in my life, the one thing I knew I would accomplish, I didn't know about anything else, but I knew I was going to write a book. I didn't know on what. So it was it was nice to see that finally come to fruition. Um, it's a daunting process, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did it. It made a big difference in my professional life. That's for sure. Talk with me about uh, your interest or love of stories. Like, where would you say that originated, or why it's, narrative? I, I would say that the the heart of it is film. Yeah, I'm just a huge film buff. I always have been. When I was a kid, I harbored a secret fantasy to be an actress, even though I never, I know sometimes I feel like as a presenter, you kind of, you have to get right. into those acting yeah. chops a little bit. Um, but yeah, I was always fascinated with film. Um, also through music. I'm a huge fan of music from the 70s. And I think it's because a lot of them, the singer songwriter era has this narrative structure throughout. So anything that has a story throughout my entire life has been compelling to me and interesting to me. Um, even when, uh, when I started my career early, I worked in technical support and I took a creative spin on that as well. You know, I would kind of talk to the printer like, what's going on? What's really going on with you? Come on, let's talk. <laughs> you know, so really just sort of, feeling the, the vibes of what's happening. What's the story of this computer? Let's sort of walk from beginning to end to see where this era could be originating from. So I've always seen things, as this connected stream of events that led to a specific outcome. And then getting into training, which, you know, I knew nothing about instructional design or any of that. It just seemed like a natural flow to start thinking about story, not just, I mean, of course, at first, at first you focus on the content and you're thinking about the story there, but really seeing the learner's journey throughout this and seeing that as a narrative and seeing that as a cohesive story that has a beginning, a middle, and an, and an end, a desired outcome. So um, I feel like my whole life I've been focused on these strings of events that pull together into a narrative. Yeah. That's really good. And when you think about like my story of getting into adult learning is a different, but it was because of my love and passion for strategic thinking and planning. And so I got mm. I was good at that. And somebody said, you should train people. Right. And so yeah. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. So that was my dive. But I love what you're saying about the music of the 70s, because <laughs> I often comment on that because that's you know, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt. I mean, mm -hmm. all those songs had this all wonderful story. And I listen to the repetitive songs of pop music today where it's just the yeah, same. Yeah, they all rely on the hook, you know. I, they don't go just, through the story that just is so rich. Yeah. And like my favorite band is Fleetwood Mac. And I just listen to them. I've been to, every time they come to Chicago, no matter how many nights they're here, I go every night. I just, my, my big splurge. I love Fleetwood Mac. And then it's, it's just all about those stories that get you and keep you invested, um, not just in the music itself, but them as people and feeling seen and feeling acknowledged. And um, you feel this community, it, it creates this sense of community of 
you know, I'm feeling the same thing and you're feeling the same thing. And, and that's what I try to do when I do write about story or if I build into my course, I want people to feel seen and validated in a way that, yes, this is an experience that I'm having too. And it's a common one. So yeah, it's a, it, it all that's flows good. together. Now, I know you have uh you have a, a free a freelance your design you, you have your own design agency and mm-hmm. you you design in in a, a well known authoring tools like articulate storyline mm-hmm. uh, and when clients come to you are are you presenting the idea of weaving a narrative or or do they come saying, how can we tie this together, Hadia? Or how does that work? Do you have do you have clients that just say, no, let's just stick with straight e-learning or mm-hmm. um Yeah. Um well at this point, a lot of times when I'm called upon, it's because of the connection to story that people are looking for. Um, but sometimes I do like I have long-term clients or, um, clients who, um, just find me in other ways. You know, I don't, I mean, stories are a tool, you know, they're a tool and every a tool is not good for every job. It doesn't apply for every fix that you're trying to make. So, um, you know, I always, I tell people that, you know, you're not supposed to be making up stories. You're supposed to be getting stories or at least inspired by what you're hearing from your stakeholders and subject matter experts. And if they aren't, if they can't or aren't willing to supply those stories, you know, people don't see their lives as a story for the most part. You see it, but they don't. Um, If they're not willing or interested to engage in that activity, then, you know, there's not, you can't force it out of them. So they have to have the vision. I mean, at the end of the day, this is their course. And I can kind of rally for it and give them, you know, the reasons why you would want to do it as far as the emotional investment. And we all give them examples of how we all know that, um, you know, the, the, the point of this course is not the subject, it's people living with this subject. You know, it's not, um, you know, compliance training, it's people complying. And I guarantee that everything that you're teaching in that ethics training, people already know, but they're not doing it. Why? So it can't just be the content that you know not to steal. <laughs> like, like, it can't just be that. There's got to be something that um, triggers my emotional sense of, of my identity and who I am that you're telling me why this is wrong and why I should be complying in a certain way. That is where the story is. Not necessarily, but there are certain times I always say that stories provide this context and the closer people are to the context, the less you may need a story, Um, the further the way they are, away they are, you probably do. So an example I use is um, if there, um, say there's an accounting system that's being implemented and the accounting team, it's just a new system for them, but they already have a system, right? So there's no need to go through Tom's journey, you know, because they they have that context. They know how to incorporate systems into their lives. But say they have a paper-based system, and this is their brand new way of forging into um, technology, and that's more realistic than you think, even this day and age. So there, the context is different because they don't know necessarily how they're going to go from there taking you know notes all the time to actually typing into the system and where the information goes and they don't physically see it and all of that. They're going to need a story around there so they can see, not for fun, but give them an idea of what their life is going to look like in this brand new world because they don't have context for it right now. So that's usually the litmus test I have is, you know, how familiar they are with the context they're in. That's really good. Really good. Because I know that one of the first things I learned when I started studying adult learning principles was that concept that you have to attach something new to something they already know and stories yeah. do that really. Cause I, I may not understand what you're trying to do with my accounting. Cause I know with paper, I, my books are going to be right. I don't know about that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I'm going to keep a set of books over here just to double check just in case. <laughs> <laughs> your technology, but I, I can understand <laughs> you start giving me something I connect and I can, Oh, I get it. I see, you know, I can, Mm -hmm. I can feel uh, more comfortable at least starting to explore that. Like, okay, I can, I can take a look at that. I can see that. That's really, really good. When you think about the value 
of learning using stories within a learning program. Like I was thinking what you said about HR compliance is not the content, it's that people will comply. Or mm -hmm. like I've seen some really great onboarding programs where the, the, the founder of the company, it's like a unique story, a, a unique individual, somebody with their mm -hmm. own, you know, bigger than life personality that's woven into the onboarding that helps to weave people into that culture of the organization more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about the learning programs and uh, like, cause sometimes we think with story, it's gotta be super elaborate, right? Like it's gotta yeah. have this whole, you know, 11 step hero's journey from beginning to end. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't, it can be, I think of one time I was walking through a parking lot at a dog park and I saw a bumper sticker and it said, who rescued who? Mm -hmm. And I started getting all teary eyed because I was like, yeah, That's a super powerful story right there in three words. It, it yeah. just made this whole backstory of possibilities there. Yeah, so it's funny you say that because at um, the conference, we were just at training magazine. Training, yeah. Um, and I did this presentation once before. Um, I sort of thought about this concept of that idea that people think their stories have to be elaborate with rich characters and all of that. And I think the way we teach storytelling, we make people feel that way. And if they're falling short of that, then they're literally abusing their learners. <laughs> they're literally being mean to them. Um, and uh, I remember seeing a review on Amazon on another storytelling book. And um, that's what they said. They're like, we don't have time for this. You don't have time to create a complete dossier on, you know, a character that's just going to be an e-learning course and we have to build the course out. And I thought about that. It's like, yeah, I, I really get that. And um, in this presentation, I sort of um, looked at it in levels and layers. And I did one for the, for the character and one for the story and how just doing little things can add a depth. And like, for example, level one is just giving that person a name, just the name in itself. We know what a name does for us and how important it is to get our name right and how that's part of you know, identity. But it also forces a point of view and at least a connection in the smallest bit, you know, that this is a person that's going through this. Um, and then that's just level one. Level two is to give that person a backstory. Right. So now you've moved beyond just their name to um, at least why they're here, um, why that matters, and how, what bearing is that going to have on the situation that they're in, right? So now you're investing people a little bit more because now they can start to see themselves in this person's backstory. And then the next level I say is voice, right? So now you're at a level where you're you have to really get to know that character because you're giving them a voice now. And especially if you have multiple characters, you need to be able to distinguish that voice from um, another voice. So, yeah, I and I just see it as just different levels that you're piling piling on. It's, it's okay to stop here. I mean, you if you don't get the investment of time from your social brand experts to get that, at least make them, a, at least acknowledge this, per, this character as a person. You know, that's the minimum you can do. Um, and then you can, you know, build from there. So, yeah, I get some, you know, I, I know people feel that way. And a lot of, there's a lot of, people still call it fluff. You know, like, I don't need to add all the, the fluff. Like, no one, no one is asking you to add fluff. Like, no one. No one we wants all, fluff. We, yeah, yeah, no, we, yeah. we think that it's important. You may not think it's important, but it's not fluff. No one's telling you to say, well, how he walked his dog this morning. No one's asking you to do that. It's all about intent. And um, being clear on what you want people to feel and what you want people to do. And so what you're adding are details to get you closer to that intent, not just to fill things out and to be fun and cute and whimsical. It's what are it's, it's like you can imagine a big a room with a wall of switches and you're just like flipping switches, you know, flipping switches to get different lights to come on in the learner's you know, mine and their emotional uh, center. Um, that's all. That's all you're doing. That's that's what you're adding. Um, and but it just takes a does take a little bit of understanding of people and yourself, really, of how you would react in certain situations. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. I think that uh, 
I love to study different uh, modalities. And of course, comedy is one of those. Mm-hmm. I think that that's something that I learned from comedians is giving every character they talk about has a name. Mm-hmm. And so like when I'm teaching like executive presence for women and they're telling a story, I was like, you may not want to use that person's real name. I'm okay with that, but give the person a name, right? Because then mm-hmm. you can develop your own language and it's a huge memory hook, like, like Bob, right? So remember the story of Bob, you know, don't be like Bob or do what Bob did, right? Bob may or may not be an actual real character, but I can remember Bob because mm-hmm. by giving him or that individual a name, all of a sudden it's a huge memory hook in our, yeah. that's how our brains think. Our brains think in that format of stories. So yeah, oh yeah it's Bob, also a I reminder. There's also a reminder that these, these are people's lives here. You know, these systems that we implement, it's it's not just a system. It is a person who is having to, you know, it, we talk about change a lot. And a person told me once, which I say this all the time because I love it so much, is that uh, people don't fear change, they fear loss. And I wish I had known that years ago when I used to do software, well, training implementations of software, And um, I would think about how, uh, you know, you'd have this longtime employee who's been working on the same system for, you know, 20 years. And here you come in with your snapper as you were in the 90s. And you're like, here's this uh, web-based system. Aren't you happy that you don't have to do 20,000 keys anymore? Yay, this is so cool. And they're like, no, it's not. Because there's a loss here. There's a loss because she had all the cheat codes. She knew it by heart. She could just keep her eyes closed. She could do, I remember that used to be a big thing when I worked in IT. People who only used the keyboard thought they were really cool. I mean, this was in the 90s, of course. And it's like, mouse, (laughs) that's a fad. You know, they're just like, you know, using the keyboard. So they're really invested in that. And that becomes a part of their identity. And to take that away, that's, that's putting her at ground zero with all the other people that she established domain over, you know, because she knew how to do this job inside and out. And that doesn't just affect her vibrato at work. It also could affect how she sees herself. It could affect her home life. It could affect many things. You know, training to me is like this sort of pebble in the water. It has these reverberating effects, good and bad, um, you know, based on what this person is, how they see themselves and how they're going to use this information. So I wish I had invested a little bit more in what, what Pearl was going through as <laughs> we as um, we implemented PeopleSoft at an organization when she used to do payroll on paper, then they put her into some database system, which was annoying enough. And now here we are putting her in some other system and she's you know, scared and frustrated because she knows people lost their jobs behind um, the move to the, the um, database system. So now what's going to happen? And she's much you know, older now and she's afraid for her security, you know? And here I am. Isn't it cool that you get to do this and this, that? No, no, it's not cool, you know? So I wish I had, but we were just like, they don't like the change. They don't want to learn, yeah. you know? Um, you and, get, but, you know. You get with it, yeah. They, yeah, yeah, and I feel great empathy for Pearl now as I, yeah. uh, I, I think about how um, the first time I realized that my day will come, is when I uh, I went to a building in Chicago, Merchandise Mart, and I had to go in an interview. And um, I saw that people were getting on the elevators, but they were stopping at this little kiosk first. So I was like, what's that? So I said, I should stop there too. So I go there and it's the whole push, what floor you're on, that whole thing. And then you're like, okay, third floor. And it says, go to elevator C. And you're like, what is going on? And you go around and you're like, elevator C. And then you're just in this death portal with no buttons that just shoots you through the sky. And you're like, oh my God, my day will come. One day I will be Pearl. (laughs) One day I will be, what is happening (laughs) with this? I like it the way it was. I know. so good, Adia. It's really good. Lord, you're just trapped in this depth. (laughs) That's so so funny. You have no uh, choice, no option. I I changed my mind. That's so funny. I know when I I started at a not-for-profit in the 90s and brought 
database computers actually to the organization and our bookkeeper. I, what I'm telling the story about, she kept a set of books by hand. Is that very, it's very real MMA. Mm -hmm. She kept her own books the entire time because that computer could make a mistake, but she wasn't. But I remember when I, I brought a young man in to give her some training on her computer and he was very sweet. He's like, so miss, because in the South, we say miss. So miss Emma, mm -hmm. tell me what you know about computers. And she said, well, where do you turn the damn thing on? <laughs> and let me tell you, I mean, we kind of joke about that being the nineties and the eighties and what have you, but I have clients now who are like, tell me about this thing called e-learning. Am I saying that right? I'm like, it's 2023. <laughs> And, you know, you would think by going to the conferences and the blogs and watching the videos that everyone, you know, got a VR headset. And that is not what's happening. <laughs> it's not what's happening out there. People are still trying to understand the role of e-learning in their world. I mean, it's just, a, yeah, it's not as common as we think it well, is. And, People are still making and the transition. reality is PowerPoint still the number one authoring tool for any kind of learning program. So even though we've got authoring tools that have a ton of bells and whistles and ease of use, you know, you have to learn it. There's a learning curve, but once yeah, you get absolutely. It, what you can do with it and for your programs. And I saw a conversation the other day about somebody who's been in gamification since the very, very beginning. He was just voicing his frustration on how much he'll call, he calls it shit gamification is out there. And a couple other people spoke up and said, you know, you're a, you were an early adopter and we can feel your frustration and the rest of the world, this is to many, they still are like, what is this gamification? That's you right. Uh, what, are we playing games all day at work? You want my people to play games all day? Is that what you're talking mm -hmm. about? So it's very slow. And I don't know if it's every industry or just L&D, because it seems like we're way behind on where, where other, like, if you look at marketing, maybe, or even like fintech, financial tech, like, L&D just seems to be so behind on bringing technology in, but it's probably also where money goes in an organization. Yeah. Well, I think money. too, we as L&D, we are of course responding to the flow and ebb of the business. And a lot of times the business is resistant to allowing us to implement things. I remember when Second Life, when Second Life came out, any new technology I think is gonna die, I call it, oh, that's just Second Lifeism. Um, so every, you know, everybody was doing second life. We're going to have interviews in second life. And then we uh, tried to install our computer and IT was like, okay, you have a half a gig of RAM and that's all you're going to have for the rest of your life. Cause no one needs more. So that's it. And we couldn't run it. Our computers would stall and we were just like, oh, well, I guess we have to nail this first life first before we get the second one. It's you know, so funny, so I remember going to workshops on Second Life to learn how to use it, right? Like, oh, this is gonna be so great. Yeah, I but we we were him we are in we were inhibited by what the or in order to security, security like so it's not always just L and D, um, because we we are dependent on how the organization wants to go. We could do a better job at making the case for it. And the business case for it, um, I, I think, but we shouldn't do it just for the sake of doing it. But if we can make a business case, we should practice that. We should implement that. And I think that's where we've fallen behind is the leadership in, in those spaces, not necessarily because we don't have the latest and, and greatest. You know. Yeah. And I think, and I know we need to wrap because we're talking too long. We can talk all day. I think one of the <laughs> lessons learned is like, we designed a, a really, I mean, just like, I, I was so proud of the work my team did for an organization based on every parameter that they gave to us. And when we took it to IT to actually upload it, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. They're like, no, we're not doing that. And I'm like, it's your LMS. Your organization has paid for this. Put it in the damn LMS. And they were like, no, we're not. And I, and I know that I know that I know that IT needs to be in the conversation from the very beginning. Yeah. But, you know, we kind of get kept getting pushed like, okay, we'll work it out. And we never did until it was mm -hmm. all done. And then, you know, then we're still make, going back and doing workarounds on it. And you, you, you're exactly right. We have to, we have to respond to where the, and so we can do a better case of, yes. And again, because IT is, it has this fear of what are you going to do to my system? What about the security here? I've been tasked yeah. with making sure that there, you know, nothing happens here. So you think you want to upload this fancy program? I'm not so sure we're ready to do that, right? Because 
this we hadn't brought them in the conversation early enough to yeah all I mean questions. they need a support model they need to know you're not going to just inundate my help desk with questions about something that they don't know about because learners aren't going to call training they're going to call the help desk <laughs> You I know, and I guess that. my technology background, help my my tech support background sort of helps me view it that way. And so we have to do a better job of saying, okay, how are we going to navigate this? And people have questions. Oh, they're self-directed learners. They won't. They will have questions. They'll they take will the have path questions. of least resistance, Ex which is exactly. called the help. Because <laughs> I can figure this out in three minutes, compatible. but I'm going to call you instead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> idea a delight as I expected I hope that you'll have time over the 48 hours to stop in some at Game of Con I know that uh, yeah, yeah. I would love it, to yeah. sit down and talk with you and ask you questions about you know everything from your experience with design and you can tell them more about what is this e-learning that you speak <laughs> of and, <laughs> and just you know developing characters or the whole concept of narration I just know there's a ton of questions out there so mm -hmm. I we have always, from the very beginning, we are like huge proponents of good learning has some kind of narrative. In gamification design, our model is narrative drives the mechanics, mechanics drive the learning. So it doesn't have to be a complex narrative. It could be something like a day in the life, right, of yeah. coming to work. But um, but that narrative is an integral part of uh, the gamification inside and not again not every gamification there's another argument that gamification doesn't even have a narrative which i can accept that premise also but mm -hmm. if we are going to use if people come to you and say okay i've heard about this gamification and then we got to write a story so hadia what what's your take on this what would be the one thing yeah. you'd want them to know well um you know stories and games have something in common and that both want people to be invested enough to get interested and remain interested. And yeah. the best way to invest people is to trigger their emotions or trigger the things that will trigger their emotions. So it's all about investment and people staying engaged throughout the process, whether it's an e-learning module or if it's playing a game. I mean, games went from, I was just thinking about Space Invaders. A while ago, this game, I had this joke I was about Space Invaders. And there was no emotional attachments to that at all. And there's a reason why now we have something like The Last of Us. You know, there's a reason why we have moved from space invaders to something that's far more profound and um, touching and something that we can empathize with. There's a reason why we did that. And that's because we want greater engagement and greater investment. And just like with our training of people logging off and not there, you know, people not staying on, staying um, in online classes for a long period of time. And yeah, we think the content, if they want to learn the content, then they will, uh, you know, stay in the course. Um, you know, however, this doesn't always work that way. There's a lot of things comp competing for their attention. And you don't get necessarily praised after completing a course. Oh, congratulations, Angela, she completed the course. Let's give her a round of applause. It's like, oh, you're back, good. You can get to work and you get to these things, this, you know? This kind of this kind of piled up while you were gone. So can exactly, you Exactly, yeah. right? So they aren't feeling those immediate rewards and benefits just from learning the content. But if you can build that somehow in the narrative where they can feel the reward and they can feel that sense of accomplishment and connection right in the experience itself, people are more likely to be, to be invested. So um, yeah, that's why I think it's all about what those things have in common is in you know, that investment and that desire to keep people engaged throughout the experience. Excellent. Really, really good. I like that so much because, you know, you hear so many different things when you're talking to decision makers and the one that I think it's probably the most frustrating. Well, there's a lot that are frustrating, but something like we pay them to know this so they'll learn it. Uh, that's a pretty risky assumption right there. You pay everybody and you have yeah, people well, who are. Well, we pay you to understand people and you clearly don't. I wouldn't say that, but. <laughs> Wait, I got to write that one down. <laughs> that's what I've thinking. I clearly don't well, understand motivation. Says. If you think, I know if you think money is the main motivator for people, like I, people leave money on the table all day long. It's not that obviously. 
<laughs> because I mean, everyone would be a rock star and right. they are so they are. now what yeah. yeah i love it that's so great <laughs> I'll, i look for the day that i can use that line <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. I'll let you know how it goes. Uh, yeah, All, right. That'd be how it goes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for spending part of your Saturday morning with me. I'm delighted to see you and connect with you again. I don't think I saw you at the training conference. No, I was, was I was locked fun, down at our booth it was nice. in Expo Hall. Yeah, I, I don't think I left Expo Hall at all <laughs> over the two days. So uh, it, it was a really great. It's so great to be back. The energy level was so high. It was uh, really good. I was telling mm-hmm. Don Mahoney that like I didn't expect it to be, you know, um, because a lot of conferences I've been to lately have been low, low, low in attendance and it this wasn't it was really good and I connected yeah. with a lot of people and all of that so yeah it exceeded yeah. my expectations by leaps and bounds that's great that's great hopefully uh you can take a look at visiting us in New Orleans in September we'd love to have you come along and mm-hmm. uh lead a session there if you're if you're a fan of New Orleans uh it'll it'll be with Techler and we'll be doing a live game of con with Techler and in September in New Orleans so we're mm-hmm. looking forward well I'll to reach that. out if I have any ideas around that I definitely want to go I wanted to go to Tech Learn, um, but because I thought it was in Austin, Texas, it was this year. Um, but um, I hear it's going to be definitely in twenty twenty four. So maybe we can yes. connect then because I definitely yes. want to go. And to that. I want an excuse to go to Austin, Texas. The facility, and if you're going to go to Austin, to want to go, the facilities that on the UT campus, and it's just the best we've done um and of course it's right there in the heart of austin so it's wa- it's a walking city you can walk mm. to where you want to go to and um so yeah it's a great